So before I jump into my talk, uh, just wanted to say we're all really hoping to see you at Fort Mason or the Burgsom Berglage in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, as Alexi mentioned, uh, there's a nice promo code up there uh, that you might want to copy down uh, for a nice discount. Um, there's also a blog uh, that we did on um, kind of an overview of what you might want to see if this is your first Scala days. Um, and um, at the end of the talk, um, we'll do a raffle for one free ticket to uh, Scala days. Um, so there's a Google thingy up there that you might want to type in or see if you can scan that QR code with your iPhone or phone in general or iPad or I don't know if you have your webcam point in the right direction. Um, but I dare you all to scan that thing or um, to, to go there and uh, fill out your name and your email. So I know, um, you know if, if your email is worth more to you than uh, Scala Days Ticket, don't. Um, you might get an email from, from, from our team um, in exchange for a chance of winning one of those tickets. Uh, so I'm going to close down that form uh, after my talk, and we'll pick a live winner. Um, oh, we'll pick a winner <laughs> live. Sorry, uh, English is not my native language. <laughs> um, that was the last time I'll use that excuse, I promise. Um, so I work for TypeSafe. Um, so a little bit of history. The rest of the talk will be about the future, I promise. Um, so I got started with Scala in uh, 2007, or at least I started working on the Scala compiler around 2007. I was using it a little bit before that. Um, so I worked on type constructor polymorphism. That was my, my thesis. Uh, and then I worked on the pattern matcher in 2.10. Uh, in 2.11, I worked on our AND build, and I refactored the XML. That was um, you know, moving up in the world. Um, and so recently, I've been working on our CI. So uh, I guess that's what a team lead does. Um, so the slides are, are up there if you want to. There's everything that's kind of in a different color is a link. So if you want to add me on Twitter, for example, that would be a link up there. I had to do that, of course. Um, but anyway, the slides are up. Uh, there's lots of links through the talk uh, in case you wanted to do some research on our future, um, because I won't have time to go into all of the details. Also, um, feel free to interrupt me uh, at any time uh, if there's anything that's not clear or you want to talk a little bit more about. So to me, this is, is, is the most important slide of the talk and you know what I want most fiercely for Scala's future and what's already happening for the future, as you can see here. Um, so it's, it's growth in the community. And, and these are the sli this, this slide shows you the numbers for the contributions um, that we get from our community and extrapolate from there uh, for usage, of course. Uh, and so, of course, the most exciting multiplier there is the times three that we got in um, the, the commit pie or the, the size of the slice of the commit pie that was taken by the community um, um, grew, uh, you know, threefold um, increase. So that's that's very exciting to see, and we can definitely you know feel that on our day to day when we're reviewing pull requests, uh, see that come in. Um, so EPFL um, has, uh, with, with TypeSafe, taken over more of, of the Scala maintenance, has had time to go back to research, as it should be. So they're working on Dottie and you know, actually writing papers. <laughs> I didn't do a whole lot of that when I was at EPFL. Um, anyway, um, so those guys are, and girls are, are back to um, our research, and that's, that explains why, why the overall contributions have gone down from them. Um, although the core team, which is about four people at EPFL and four at, at TypeSafe, is, is pretty stable across time. Um, and, and one more thing to point out in, in, in this list is that um, you know, there's roughly half as many commits in 2.11 as to 2.10. So that's, that's a big part of the stabilization. I mean, maybe they're just twice as big every, every commit, I don't know. But uh, I didn't do that math. Um, but the, the key idea is that we do want to stabilize uh, Scala releases and every upgrade even you know, after a lot of investment in your, in your build infrastructure, even without that, you should be able to upgrade much more easily from 2.10 to 2.11, and even more so for future releases. So um, I'll first kind of give you a, a sketch of the outline of the talk, and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, the three major releases that I'll cover uh, in, in this talk. Um, so up next, obviously, is, is 2.12. And so that release will focus on the compiler. We've decided to 
alternate releases that focus on compiler uh, changes and library changes. Also, with the idea that it would be easier to upgrade for everybody um, if not both of those change. Um, less of a moving target. And um, 212 is very easily summarized as Java 8. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And the other really exciting thing is that uh, Miguel Garcia's uh, optimizer is finally landing. Um, uh, it's already landing um, incrementally as an experimental feature in 2.11, uh, and it'll be the default backend in 2.12. Um, and that's Lucas um, on the on the TypeSafe team that's that's working on, um, you know, making that production ready. So 2.12 will be out uh, early next year. Um, sorry, wrong key. I had to try the latest JavaScript presenting framework, of course. <laughs> Someone wanted PDFs of this. <laughs> Does anybody know how to make PDFs of JavaScript? No, it's just not. Anyway, um, so uh, the next one uh, is, is, is codenamed IDA because we don't want to commit to version numbers um, because then the rest of the year we'll talk about what it's going to be, you know, 2.13 or 14 or 2.12-1. Um, we've done all of that in the past. Um, we decided just to abstract from them and we'll just call it IDA. So as I, as I already implied, it's going to be a library release, and um, we're going to try and do what we can to make Stu happy, um, although we're still going to focus on removing stuff from the standard library. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't want to add more modules, uh, and, and that goes back to the um, community growth and, and contribution thing. So in 2.11, we, we spent a lot of time uh, modularizing a part of the standard library, kind of where we saw the low-hanging fruit for potential contributions. And, those all have now. Those all have standard SBT builds and have maintainers or multiple maintainers per project. Actually, so that's that's very healthy, except maybe for um, Scala XML. Um, sorry, um, but who knows? Um, so we want more of those, and you know, validation would be a great example. Um, the main thing that'll keep a lot of people busy, I, I imagine, um, for in that time frame, is going to be rewriting their macros. I'm, I'm not going to be talking too much about that tonight, but I, I have a rule that every talk that I give about, mac, about Scala, I have to say, I have to tell people not to use macros. So please don't use them. They're experimental. <laughs> um, and if you do use them, you implicitly agree to our end user agreement that you will be refactoring your macros as we change them, because that's what experimental means. They're going to change. Um, and we mean it. I know, and as easy as it's been to upgrade from 2.10 to 2.11 for the macros, it's going to be a lot harder uh, for the next generation. Um, you want to be using quasi quotes, and you don't want to be casting down to like the internals of the compiler for refactoring that thing. You can't want to have both be have the compiler be faster and a stable uh, macro API. So we chose faster compiler. Sorry, um, I hope you'll forgive us. Um, but it's experimental, so we told you so. Um, so we're roughly on an 18-month uh, release cycle, um, and I kind of count 12 months between the .3 or .4 release. Um, so we're at .5 now because of a little snafu <laughs> earlier in the 2.11 cycle. But so in about a year, you'll see uh, 2.12 land. Um, and then a year, and then 18 months after that, Aida. So um, I, I predict, but we're already well into the future now. Uh, I predict that Don Giovanni will have two acts, uh, and the first one um, will rework the back end, and a lot of interesting ideas are being tried out and proven already, um, as far as the back end goes, in, in the Dottie incubator at EPFL. So there's going to be a lot of interesting things coming out of that, both a faster back end, so uh, by back end I mean everything after type checking, which in the end is, you know, still a significant part, but the type checker is really where most of the work is done. Yeah. It used to be that you could watch a particular GitHub project, but that commits there seemed to slow down. Is there a new place to watch Dottie? Um, no, I think that's that's just how it is. There is a I know that they have a staging uh, repository, um, but to be honest, uh, it's been a while since I, I was last in Lausanne in summer, so that's when I last really like talked to them face to face. Um, um, I know that back then they're working in a staging repository um, that might be under the same the same project, under the same uh, project user. Um, but in the end, like, that's still their official one, and the pull requests have slowed down because you know, they're also getting to a point where it's a little bit more mature for, you know, as far as that counts in the first year of something. Um, so, but anyway, one of, the one of the two of the ideas I wanted to highlight in the introduction here is that 
phase fusion is, is, is something that we think is going to help really well uh, with, with the current Scala compiler. There's, you know, two dozen phases that the compiler does to boil it down to stuff that the VM, JVM can understand. And they're all, you know, spinning out new trees every time. And the GC doesn't like that. Um, there's rumors have it that Scala C is also being used to stress test the JIT because uh, it's one of the projects that take the longest ever uh, before it starts warming up and, and actually like, you know, emitting fast code. Anyway, so we definitely were paying attention to that. And I mean, for, from a user's perspective or from a library developer's perspective, some recent ideas around binary compatibility that are already kind of being solidified in the Dottie code base are gonna, are gonna land, I think, predict in this time frame. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, of course. And then the second act, um, and the whole idea here is that we, we, we really need to manage this change carefully because even though we have Perl and we have SED and we have AWK and I'm sure by then we'll have, you know, abide fix it or something like that, um, it, it's still, we, we don't take compatibility lightly. So we, we, we are excited about adding new features, new modules, cleaning up mistakes in the past. I mean, even Java is moving faster <laughs> these days. So we, we definitely won't, don't want to get behind their pace and we won't. Um, but at the same time, we want to be very careful when we get to changing the language and what it means. Um, so most of all, it will be focused on removing stuff that is deprecated already now or that will be deprecated by then and just simplifying the internal foundations of, of the theory of the type system. And uh, very little of that will actually percolate to the, to the level of, of where you write your code. And we're looking to uh, put Andrew and Nerman out of business with their Scala Puzzler series because we just can't have that stuff. Anyway, nothing personal. So um, some more details uh, about, about 2.12. So there was a, a blog post. We do try to you know, be more open about these things. It's not like we're sitting at you know, the office down the street and wondering about what we're going to do and then not tell anybody and then re release it. So we welcome your feedback. And, and um, uh, this has been out there for a while. And you know, this is basically the summary. Although I guess I could tell you a little bit more about it. So I already said it's going to be out in early 2016. Um, we debated it for a really long time whether we're going to, you know, even do Java 8 and require Java 8 um, because for the longest time we haven't we haven't revved the Java the requ required Java version. Um, I think our decision in hindsight was is a no brainer now that you see how Java 8 is being adopted. But that by no means was clear, you know a year and a half ago or so, when we were, or at least not to us, when we were doing this. Um, and to hedge our bets and to help everybody in upgrading 2.11 and 2.12, both internally the compiler code base and the library code base um, uh, will be very closely aligned, um, which is why 2.12 is a compiler release as well. Um, and so everything that will be in 2.12, and you may have noticed there hasn't actually been a milestone release for 2.12, that's because it's kind of secretly living in the closet of, of the 2.11x branch. Like there's flags that will enable the functionality that's going to become default in 2.12. So um, we also have pants. Um, we call it dbuild. And we build about a million lines of, of community code. Um, and we have that running on 2.11. So we want to be able to easily test what's going to happen in 2.12. And that's much easier if you just have to fl flip a couple flags, um, kind of going back to um, you know, lessons learned from Twitter. <laughs> Um, apparently, so um, yeah. So anyway, um, I think it's it's pretty important to emphasize that you know the, the differences between major versions of Scala are, are trending to be smaller every time. So one of one of the key features of 2.12, um, and this will land soon um, in in 2.11, probably 2.11.7, um, is that we emit the same bytecode as Java C does uh, for lambdas, um, and that's that's basically always been our strategy, right? You know, there's a bunch of JIT hackers at Oracle and at Twitter and, you know, lots of other places as long as not us. <laughs> we don't do VM hacking. We don't do any of that. And we're very happy staying. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I rarely dare to venture into the back end. I stay in the type checker. That's as, that's as down and dirty as I get. Uh, anyway, so um, Jason Zog, one of my colleagues, is working on having our compiler um, basically look like Java as far as the JIT is concerned. Um, and we just, we'll just you know, have Oracle pay for that. Um, default methods are, are something that 
that, that's very exciting at, at first sight for you know getting rid of the expensive trade compilation scheme, both expensive because of the interactions through static calls to the forwarders and the binary compatibility story that's a bit hampered. Why can't I add a new concrete method to a trait? Well, I'm sorry, it's actually an abstract method in an interface. Um, so we don't know yet for sure how far we'll be able to push this because traits are quite a bit more powerful than, than Java interfaces, Java 8 interfaces with the vault methods, I mean. Um, but we're definitely going to do it for all the function and classes. And um, most likely, we will be too lazy to write the bytecode or by hand, or we're definitely not going to port that to Java. So the Scala compiler is going to have some support for emitting traits or interfaces with default methods. I don't think it's going to happen for all traits. Um, there's, um, and so it's probably going to be opt-in. Um, this is something that I worked on in the type checker, and that's been in 2.11 since 2.11.4, I think. Um, I bumped it a little bit for 2.11.5. Um, so this allows you, um, in addition to pretending to be Java, um, will also give Scala developers an easier time to call into Java 8 uh, functional APIs. So um, of course, uh, Java couldn't be bothered to reuse our function and traits. They had to come up with their own uh, solution, which I love, by the way. I think it's a, it's a great solution. Um, but we'll have, just have to go with the flow there. And so the type checker will just synthesize the right classes just like Java C does. So our interop with Java 8 goes both ways, is I guess what I'm saying. It is really a uh, long-winded way. Um, Wildcards make everything hard, and I hate them. Um, but I'll figure it out eventually how to do type inference in our setting um, to, to, um, to make that work in general. Uh, it's just yeah, horrible. Anyway, um, I'm not going to go too much through the code, but that's why I put up the link. I just want to do show you real quick uh, what I was talking about before. So um, I don't know if I can easily zoom in here. Is this somewhat readable from the back or not at all? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so what you're seeing here is, uh, and you'll just have to take my word for it because I don't have a fancy REPL embedded in, in this talk, um, but you can look at the gist or the, the code of the talk. Um, so when you run Scala 2.11 under X experimental, it'll, it'll enable this particular feature that will be on in default, by default in 2.12. And so you can just call into stream, uh, and that is Java util stream, uh, not our own stream, or Java util stream stream. Meta factory. Um, so you can just you know make an array from a list. Um, commented out here is the Java code that looks just a little bit nicer to my uh, Scala eye than in Java, but it's basically the same uh, the same stuff, right? And so basically the idea is you know we just want to make sure that we interoperate cleanly with Java eight. This is where the wildcards come in. This is something that you won't have to do eventually, but um, type inference sometimes gets into trouble because it infers wildcards for everything because Java doesn't have definition set variants. Um, but most of the code just carries over straightforwardly, and I'm not, I don't, I really don't intend to go into the details. You, um, it's just the idea that um, you can write Scala code that uses Java APIs in the same way as a Java 8 programmer does. Um, and so the way that works, if you're curious behind the scenes, if you write the, the thing up top, uh, what the Scala compiler actually does is the same thing as a Java compiler. It tries to figure out what is that interface that they're using in this, in this method call to represent a function. Let me create an anonymous subclass of it and implement the single abstract method in there with that body that's lifted out. So I think it's straightforward to see what the correspondence is, but, but behind the scenes, a lot of type inference and overloading resolution and wildcard capture and all that stuff needs to happen. Um, but we're just shooting for par with Java um, when it comes to calling their methods. Um, so to kind of illustrate the pain, um, and, and, and you know, I, so we love that Java 8 uh, provides better support for functional programming. We're also confident that Scala has a better approach uh, and many levels to it. And I think this is one of the examples. I mean, this is not the true signature of map in the collection libraries. I know there's a can build from there. Um, but imagine tacking that on to the signature that Java uses. Um, and my, the main bane there is that since you don't have, well, it probably shouldn't be pointing at the screen, only I can see. Um, so up here, you know, in case your Java uh, is rusty, good for you. Um, <laughs> these are wild cards. Um, you know, and that's a function type 
And this is exactly the same thing semantically in, in Scala, and I'll show you why. So um, I'm just going to spoil the surprise. I hope you won't mind. So we define uh, the T as contravariant and the result as covariant. And that means that this is what the library developer did once in 2004 or something. And this is what the users do all the time. They just write the function type. And this is actually the same as arg, arrow, res, because you can write types infix. You can write your own types like function that you can infix that way. Um, and if I was going to write the, the Java equivalent in Scala syntax, um, I wouldn't write any job in, uh, variance annotations here. Uh, all interfaces are assumed invariant. But then the price paid for that is every single use site has to sit, treat this very, very carefully and say, well, this was actually meant to be a contravariant one, and this was meant to be a covariant one. So you push down the pain to all your users. You know, I never think about variants. I just write pluses and minuses until it compiles. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I once wrote a thesis about variants, polymorphism, and then just something short-circuited or something, and since then I just don't want to deal with variants anymore. Figure it out once in the compiler, and, uh, and then just let the thing, let that do its thing. You know, computers are much better at fiddling those math thingies than we are. So that's the point that I'm trying to make: is library designers don't even have to understand. Just don't feel bad if you don't. If you feel, if you understand it, that's great. I mean, that that helps you. But the point is, even if you don't, you'll get it right eventually, <laughs> pretty quick, pretty quickly. If you you don't, the great thing is in, in Java, you don't have to think about it at all. But then everyone else is going to think about it, or their types won't be compatible, or they won't be subtypes. You won't be able to pass in something that actually relaxes the requirements on the argument, and Java will say, but wait, what? This is unrelated. So I, I wrote down some more stuff, but I'm not going to go through it. Um, so you know, the, the subtyping rule reads really naturally when variance is at play. Um, I tried to read the papers, it's been so long. I tried to read the papers on, on what actually existential subtyping is with uh, bounded polymorphism. Uh, I just had to write a talk, so I just couldn't. I, <laughs> anyway, this is equivalent. So when you push this down, you know, in the end, you get the same type subtyping rules on your function types if you're careful and have all your users write all the wildcards everywhere. We just don't want to do that to you. All right, so this is getting farther into the future, um, which is signified by the upper names. We also blogged about this uh, on Scala Lang, so I encourage you to read that. Um, but most of all, it's a simplification. And I think one of the lessons that we've learned with uh, the collection library, um, well, we learned many lessons. <laughs> uh, one of the lessons that we learned was that inheritance isn't always the best solution uh, for, for extension. Um, and I would have to sit down for quite a long time to make sure that I you know, implement it traversable-like correctly for my, for my own collection. And that's just, that's not how it should be. And um, we intend to fix that in, in, in AIDA, um, mostly by making everything final so you can't extend it. <laughs> And then providing cleaner hooks. Um, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, there will be some nice cleanups there. And, and the, mo the main examples will be parallel collections, which give rise to this um, exponential blow up in the, parent, uh, in the parent traits for all those collections with Gen Seek and so on. Those will be moved out. And uh, parallel collections where very rarely you want to, um, you know, you just, it, it, it's, it's kind of going back to what was said earlier, I think it was Stu, about you know, O versus FP and extension methods versus overriding and dynamic binding. And for parallel collections, you don't really want uh, dynamic binding. You just want to, to um, have your splitterator, like Java did it, and then, have, and then uh, enrich or pip on whatever you prefer, uh, some parallel goodness on top of that. And the same for views. And the way that we, that we plugged it in Overriding all the right hook methods um, makes it really hard to to inherit things and just blows up the the, the, the subtyping diagrams. So caveat inheritor: um, things are going to change uh, in your parent types, um, but the aim is that most users won't notice. Like 
there is really no need for you to be extending collection classes, at least not you know in the middle there or at the top. Um, and so we'll first go through a deprecated final, um, deprecated non-final cycle, and so on. So if you he if you give heed to deprecation warnings, you won't notice too much of these changes. And in fact, we did a lot of that already in 2.11. Um, OK. So um, call for help, which I, I didn't adequately convey um, in the beginning of my talk. So we're, we're really thrilled with all these contributions, and we, we want more of them, both on the you know, submitting pull request and reviewing pull request, or coming up with new modules. And, and maintaining them and seeing where that takes you. And if it proves out, you know, we'll be happy to include it in the distribution. Um, but hopefully that'll be as easy as just adding a dependency to Scala library all. One of the ideas with the 2.11 modularization was that we did a couple of modules, we made an SBT plugin to do them. Uh, and so now we hope other people will start developing modules like that. And they'll fit, they'll fit right in and we'll, we'll add them into the, the blessed selection of modules. So what, what we're planning on doing is, is lazy collections, um, probably something with Java streams, or maybe something with transducers, or full transformers, or whatever you like to call them. Are they catamorphisms? Who knows? Um, anyway, so uh, that's one of them um, that's going to move out. Uh, parallel collections, there's, there's a great Scala Blitz project by some EPFL uh, grad students. Um, and, and actually Java 8 did a pretty good job. And we've been comparing the performance of, of just you know, implementing a splitterator for all the Scala collections and then benchmarking .par versus .splitterator and then using the, uh, the Java 8 APIs and um, it works pretty well. So we're probably, that's another thing where we're gonna make sure to play, well, play nice with Java 8. And validation is something that um, was the Scala team at TypeSafe twice the size we would have long done. Um, but we haven't gotten around to it yet. So that's one of the things that is also an open invitation um, to find the right mix of, of Scala Zenus and, well, the opposite of Scala Z. <laughs> um, I just want to reemphasize that, um, you know, as I said before, macros are going to change. So Scala Mita, uh, I mean, there will likely be a talk at one of the Scala days near you uh, about it. Uh, it's going to be a big rewrite. It's, I think it's a nicer approach than what we have right now, but it's going to be a big change. Um, you know, don't tell anybody. I'm just really trying to make this case strongly so no one will be disappointed at the end. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm kind of confused by these hip JavaScript frameworks. Yeah. Okay. So. That, that was that for, <laughs> I've never done a two-dimensional presentation before. Um, there's, I feel like I'm in a video game. I have three options. I think I'm going to go down. Okay, so <laughs> I hope, I don't know, I hope nothing scary is waiting there. So Don Giovanni, um, we're, I mean, it's really cool to see EPFL do more research again. I was there when we were really crunching to keep our, our big industrial users happy, even though we might not always have succeeded doing that. Um, so now they're back to doing what they, what they, what they love and what they do well. Um, and, and so there's a lot of good ideas in Dottie that um, will use as inspiration to refactor the Scala compiler. Um, yeah. So, but like I said before, we're focused on, on some migration uh, strategy and we're very well aligned with EPFL there. Um, so we want to drop procedure syntax. Very heated debates about that because it's syntax. But you know, I really like being able to say it in Scala, all definitions are keyword name, signature, and then equals body or nothing. You know, I really like that regularity. It helps with code formatting. Um, you know, actually doing a refactoring like this with said could bite you quite a bit. Um, I don't know what exactly <laughs> I don't want to see the size of the regex uh, you'd come up with to, to migrate from, from procedure syntax to equal something. Um, but anyway, there are some cool corner cases you might run into. Um, XML literals, one's the single biggest selling point for Scala, are probably not going to be there. They probably won't make it into the next decade. Um, anyone ever use early definitions? I'm just wondering. Early definitions going once, 
All right, well, you just sealed their fate. They're gone. Um, so instead, you'll get trait parameters, which is a nice generalization and something we get asked about a lot. Why don't traits have them? Well, we just had, we had early definitions. Why didn't you use those? <laughs> anyway, um, please don't use them. They're going to go away. Um, so simpler semantics. I mean, that's that's exciting for the for for research and maintainers. I think. Personally, if I was trying to sell the Scala upgrade, um, I wouldn't lead with that. I don't think pragmatically that's the most important thing. I mean, the most important thing is that your compiler will be run faster, your documentation will be better, your tooling will be more stable, and so on. And then maybe somewhere deep down there, you know, we have a really nice theory. Um, but you know, theory, whatever, it's for those guys across the street. So anyway, um, in Dottie, there will be no more uh, type parameters and all that crazy stuff. We'll just have type members, members all the way down. So we're really going to be object oriented. You know, none of that FP universal quantification, blah. It's all going to be members. And that was actually, I mean, to, just to give you the background, I'm, I seem to be you know down on all this. This is what I wrote my thesis about. So um, just so we're clear. Um, uh, there, since then, ideas have refined and evolved, and you know, um, crystallized, and all that good stuff. So it's coming to it's it's coming to a Scala compiler near you, and it's already in a Dottie compiler. Uh, I won't go into the technical details, but it's it's pretty neat. Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen Stack Overflows in the Scala compiler, or ginormous types as a result of you know matches that were just a little bit too precise, um, precisely typed. I mean. So we're basically going to delay those blow-ups um, and introduce union types to, to model them. And there will be support for something like what you're asking for with type-safe records. Uh, the compiler will, will just say, will, will integrate a, a mini mile seven or something. Um, and so Martin recently gave a talk about binary compatibility. He was standing right here. Um, he autographed pictures afterwards. I don't expect that's going to happen today, but that's OK. <laughs> I'm happy to stand in his shadow. Anyway, um, so binary compatibility, um, the idea is there that basically every class file, every jar will ship with the source. Um, not exactly the source, though, the source after type checking. So the source that is insensitive to changing your dependencies or insensitive to the exact nature of implicit search, which we don't dare touch during minor releases because it might change your types. Um, so everything will be elaborated, everything will be horrible, you won't want to write that kind of source, but it will be so specific that you can just rerun the backend really quickly and recompile everything if your lazy val encoding changed, let's say. Um, so that should speed up things like pants or dbuild, um, and it should also speed up, just in general, evolving libraries, because you, you will be able to add, you know, change vals into lazy vals or add stuff to traits. As long as it's source compatible, it'll be binary compatible by definition or not by definition, but by construction. And in, in Java, that's, I think, one of the main confusions that are, you know, people are so used to thinking, well, it's source compatible, so it's binary compatible, right? And that's one of the pain points in Scala because of all the trickery that we need to go through to make all that stuff compile to bytecode is that there's a huge gap between what, what you can do source compatibly and what you can do binary compatibility. And so this will resolve that with the smallest investment possible. Okay, um, well, um, thank you. Um, happy to take more questions, um, comments, give you a chance to fill out that form, uh, and which I'm gonna shut down in a couple minutes and then we'll pick a winner. Um, but yeah. No more questions? No one trying to delay the... Okay. And I'll ask you two questions. All right, cool. Uh, so one is, uh, when Martin visited Nitro recently, uh, he got asked about, you know, when kind of regular mortal programmers are going to grow complicit. And he said that, you know, this as a new feature is going to be internalized later. He actually says in .dot implicit are going to replace one ads, and everything is going to be used, you know, with implicit and implicit composable. So I wonder what's your take on the future of implicit. And my second question is: in the end of Don Giovanni, Caminatore falls into hell and drags uh, Don Giovanni with him. So what's it going to be in Don Giovanni? Okay. 
Let me ask her the second question first because it's a shorter answer. I haven't seen the movie or read the book or I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that one either. But um, yeah, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a longer answer to your second question. I'll go back to the first in the meantime while I think about the second question. Um, so the first question was about implicits and monads, and I'm trying to reverse engineer the question because I think it must have been about how you deal with effects or how you do like an effect tracking system and whether you want to do that with free monads and you can composing them and so on, or you, know, you want to pass around tokens that say you can do this or you have done this, now you must carry on the taint. And that's kind of what implicits are, right? They're like a lightweight mechanism to either give you permission to do something, you can't call this method unless you have this magic implicit that there's no other way of creating, or you know, when you do some side, side effect from then on, you, you will have to, or actually you will have to consume that token, I guess is what I'm saying. So, um, you know, that's very much in the research stage. I've, I've talked to Martin a couple of times about this, but I don't think it's more concrete than thinking about how, how you might model you know, this idea of, of having capabilities, passing them on and consuming them, um, which is very close to effect tracking and, and kind of what monads do in a way, but you can, they can, they do anything, they can, you can make them do anything, right? So, um, and for the second question, could you repeat it? <laughs> I forgot about it. Okay, yeah. Yep. So, My question is about SPT. You didn't mention SPT at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so SPT is a horrible slow. So even though sometimes the, the the jar files are already in the IB repository, they keep resolving it and take mm -hmm. a long time. So, uh, you, and in your talk, you also mentioned about uh, you're using pens, or I don't know. It's a, no. No. So any any improvements on SPT coming away? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thanks for your question. So the question was about um, SBT and uh, slowness of resolving dependencies. So Recently, Eugene, um, I, I'm not sure which SBT version it landed in, um, did some work on caching the graph for the, the dependency graph and um, cutting off like 30 seconds for resolution because it, Ivy had to do lots of crazy stuff to build that graph over and over again, even though we could just cache it and then and just quickly walk it. But um, one of the reasons uh, that I haven't talked much about SBT is that it's a different team. <laughs> And we don't talk to each other. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, no, SVT, I think I haven't talked about it is because it's just pretty stable. Like we, we have it where, where, we like, where we'd like it to be. Um, it's going to go 1, 0 pretty close in the pretty cl uh, near future, sorry. And I think it'll just, it'll just mature. I mean, I think there is not a lot of exciting stuff in SVT's future except Usage and happy user, happier users, better, better documentation, better performance, but that's about it. I would imagine. Um, yeah, question in the back, Stu. So, do you see deeper integration between uh, SBT and dbuild happening? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is about SBT and dbuild integration. So uh, dbuild is is um, is to SBT what pants is to, uh, I guess, ant or something. <laughs> Um, so um, dbuild does, is, is kind of an SVT plugin that does a lot of really nasty rewiring um, to mimic Google Blaze or Pants or something reusing SVT build. So basically you have a bunch of links to repositories that all have SVT builds. dbuild forks all the repositories, override, like in injects its plugin into those SVT builds and then rewires all their dependencies to go to be recompiled from source instead of uh, fetched from from Maven or or whatever, um, uh, yeah. I mean, dbuild is 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 great for us, and it's also open source. And um, I think it's kind of on the same time limit as SBT. Like we don't foresee any major new features for that, but it's definitely something that we want to support. Other questions. All right. Thank you. Well.